So my friends, when we think of a place like Singapore, the first thing that comes to mind, let me guess, is probably imposing skyscrapers, its huge airport, the shopping malls, or perhaps its elegant bay, flanked by the Merlion and the spectacular Marina Bay Casino. You might even get images of crowds and lots of people squeezed together. After all, Singapore is one of the most densely populated places on the planet. In fact, only 30% of its territory remains unbuilt. And of that percentage, the vast majority of the spaces left are mountains, parks and protected areas. So, as you can probably imagine, Singapore is not exactly what you would call an agricultural powerhouse. Singapore is most likely associated with the financial industry, trade, tourism or its port, maybe even with high-tech companies but certainly not with agriculture. In fact, less than 1% of its entire territory is occupied by farms. Obviously, it's not surprising that with Singapore's rapid population growth over the past few decades, most of its land has been used for housing, offices, and commercial space. As a result, the country's primary sector, especially agriculture and livestock farming, has virtually disappeared. As an example, while Singapore had about 15,000 hectares of arable land and agricultural activity, which accounted for 3% of GDP in 1960, today there are fewer than 600 hectares, and its share of GDP is less than 0.02%. In other words, since 1960, Singapore has lost 96% of the area devoted to food production. On the other hand, this could be seen as completely normal sign of the times. As it became richer and richer, Singapore replaced oxen and tractors with luxurious office skyscrapers, bank branches and vaults of gold. That's right, Singapore has also become the world's leading storage centre for precious metals that are stored inside vaults in high, very high security facilities. And don't think that it was only a strictly economic issue, because in a way, it was also a political one. For example, in 1984, the government banned the opening of new pig farms because of the bad odours and environmental problems that they poised, which is something left out of George Orwell's 1984. Since then, the number of farms was reduced from about 200 to only 22 by 1990. And today, there isn't a single one left. And friends, as you can imagine, this is a dynamic that has consequences. To give you an idea, Singapore currently produces only around 8% of the basic food needs of its population locally. That's one of the lowest percentages in the world. So they have no choice but to import practically everything they need to eat. On the other hand, this is what happens in most cities and therefore there's not really anything wrong with it. The point is that Singapore is not only a city but also a country. So its food supply depends on international agreements, free trade deals or how currencies are fluctuating. Despite all this, it must be noted that Singapore ranks first in the World Food Security Index. Check this out. Wait just a minute though, because now, after the havoc wreaked on world trade by the SARS Coronavirus 2 crisis, things in Singapore may be changing. In fact, the government of this city-state has suddenly pivoted and has put on the table its intention to drastically increase agricultural production using a very unusual model. But why? Why does the government of one of the most prosperous places in the world want to revive agricultural activity? And why now? Does it make sense to do so? Is it really possible in a city dominated by skyscrapers, international financial headquarters, endless shopping malls and buildings everywhere? So my friends, would you like to come with us to learn more about this amazing venture by the Singaporean government? If so, let's get cracking. The return of agriculture? Singapore has set itself a goal, the 30 times 30 express plan. That is to produce 30% of the food they consume by 2030. And watch out, because when the Singapore government sets its mind to do something, it seldom fails to achieve it. So far, the government has already invested at least 200 million US dollars in this venture throughout various channels, including almost 40 million dollars invested directly by the Singapore Food Agency. But the question, the big question is, how on earth can agriculture be developed in a place like this? Well, you see, the Singaporean government believes that this can be achieved by actively supporting a new type of agriculture, what is known as agri-food tech, agri-tech or high-tech agriculture. They haven't come up with a good acronym yet. Whatever the name, the point is that this way of cultivation has practically nothing to do with the traditional methods that we all know. High-tech agriculture is a new form of intensive, or you could say ultra-intensive, farming, which involves making the most of the available space and 
being super efficient in order to multiply farm yields. If we think of, for example, a traditional lettuce farm, they require a certain growing time and climatic conditions that are not necessarily found everywhere. Well, all of these limitations practically disappear in agritech farms, places that are more like laboratories than the traditional factories that we all know. In these high-tech farms, the vegetables are grown in a kind of modern greenhouse, arranged vertically on walls in rows on top of each other. They receive artificial light and heat, humidity and temper conditions are optimised for each crop, and they are irrigated with nutrient-enriched water. In some cases, harvesting is even automated with the use of robots. We aim to capture a significant share of the economic opportunities in the agri-food tech sector. Okay, so all of this sounds almost like a science fiction movie, or that kind of crazy project that was supposed to, a while ago to grow vegetables on the moon. Where are my moon vegetables? However, believe me when I tell you that there is absolutely nothing fictional about these farms. <laughs> In Singapore and in other countries around the world, this type of exploitation is blooming. <laughs> See what I did there? And the truth is that it has become a very promising activity. For example, this city-state we are talking about already has 31 farms in operation, while in 2016 it only had 12. In recent years, in fact, both the number of farms and food production have been experiencing steady growth, both for the production of vegetables and also for that of fish. And watch out, because the government's gamble has only just begun. Of course, at this point, I'm sure the question many of you are asking is, all right, Grant, but why have they embarked on such a project? What are the Singaporean government's reasons for pursuing the 30 times 30 venture? Why on earth have they already invested more than $200 million in this scheme? The main argument they have put on the table is none other than ensuring their food supply chain. As we told you at the beginning of this video, Singapore is almost totally dependent on imports to feed its population. At the same time, as we also told you, this is the most food secure country in the world. The question is, how is this possible? It should be either one or the other. Don't you think? You see, the truth is that Singapore imports food from a huge number of different places. In 2019, this country imported food from more than 170 different countries in total. Logically, it is very difficult to imagine that a large number of these 170 countries would suddenly have problems supplying Singapore with everything that this urban republic needs. But, of course, then the argument for securing food supply loses force. Many analysts say that the government is actually pursuing three objectives at the moment. Firstly, to promote technological research and and to create new jobs. Secondly, to increase quality and not necessarily quantity, particularly as regards fresh produce. And thirdly, to improve the country's image by reducing its carbon footprint. Reducing food imports would reduce the use of freight transport and thus make it easier for Singapore to meet its greenhouse gas emission commitments. Of course, on paper, this all looks very impressive. But now, is there any country that Singapore can look at and say, yes, it can be done. And is it worth it? Well, the truth is, yes. Although it is quite far away from this sovereign city. Specifically, it's here in Europe. We are, of course, talking about the Netherlands. A country that, as we've told you before here on Visual Politic, has managed to become one of the largest exporters of food in the world. Food grown in advanced greenhouses using the latest technology. But just in case you missed that video, do you need a quick reminder? If so, shame on you for not watching all of our videos. But listen up, because in the medium and long term, this may be the result of that the Singaporean government is dreaming of. The era of LEDs and artificial climate. From the outside, many of these farms may look like normal greenhouses. But from the inside, it's a different story. The Dutch example is plainly and simply impressive. Since 2000, they have succeeded in converting many traditional farms into high-tech farms, multiplying production and reducing the resources used by half, and all with virtually no chemical pesticides used in the process. Even in the most modern poultry farms, the use of antibiotics has been reduced by 60%. And that's not even the best part. Thanks to this neo-agriculture model, the Netherlands has managed to become, measured in dollars, the second largest food exporter in the world, only behind the United States, whose territory is 270 times larger. In addition, the country already has a cluster of more than 20 universities focused on agricultural research. In short, the Dutch produce much more, in less space, in a more sustainable way. And on top of that, this practice has allowed them to become an agricultural export power. Who would have thought? The Dutch. 
And of course, at this point, perhaps the only controversial element of this whole story has to do with the cost. And I say controversial not because it's wrong, but because, let's not kid ourselves, it's something that tends to generate a bit of a social uproar. Setting up an agrotech farm requires investing a lot, a lot of money. For example, a 10,000 meter squared farm can involve an investment of several tens of millions of dollars, which is obviously not affordable for most of us. Precisely because of this, these types of operations are usually promoted by medium and large companies and depend heavily on how the financing channels work. Therefore, the more developed the financial markets are and the less reliance there is on bank financing, the more inclusive this model will be. In other words, we are no longer talking about the bucolic, idyllic and rural image of traditional farms, but about real food production factories that may end up revolutionising the entire primary sector. You see, for the moment, in the case of Singapore, for example, costs are slightly higher than those of imports. In fact, according to the data available, the prices of vegetables produced in these high-tech farms are 5% higher than those imported from countries such as Malaysia, Indonesia and Thailand. So, does this all mean that they're not competitive? Well, my friends, quite the contrary. As you can see, the difference is very small and the cost of ultra innovative farms is related to scale, experience and technological development. In other words, if the activity is just starting and its current costs are not unreasonable, the room for improvement is gigantic. Using our brand of quality and trust to be able to export such quality products to the region to meet the growing needs of uh, the Asia Pacific. But well, who knows? Will Singapore end up replicating the Dutch model in the heart of Asia? And will one of the richest countries on earth become a major food player? Who knows at this point? But maybe their efforts could be the way to avoid news like this. 10% of Singaporeans struggle to get sufficient, safe, nutritious food. Study The Straits Times. In the end, only time will tell. For now, let's open a debate in the comments with all of you. What do you think of these new farming models? Can you imagine the future stars of Silicon Valley, Shenzhen or Singapore planting tomatoes, carrots and lettuces? Leave your answer in the comments below. Thanks for watching guys, we really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Hope you enjoyed it and as always, I'll see you next time. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.